Hello everybody, my name is Dratnos, and in this video I'm going to talk about a new change that we've learned about in Shadowlands, which is the removal of War Scrolls of Battle Shout, War Scrolls of Intellect, and War Scrolls of Fortitude. Initially we thought that these temporary buff replacer scrolls uh, were going to make it into Shadowlands. There were writs of them that were, or were data mined to be in the game and have since been removed. So uh, it appears right now that there is not going to be a way to get a profession-created version of almost any class-specific utility, with the exception of drums, but even drums are getting hard nerfed down to uh, 15%, which is a, a massive nerf. They're, they're now going to be massively worse than Bloodlust, Heroism, or Time Warp, warp instead of being slightly worse. So uh, Shadowlands is going to be all about bringing the specific classes that have that ability rather than that it being a small bonus to bring one of those classes. Um, on the on the upside here, one thing that this does mean is that you're going to have a little bit less consumable costs from this directly. On the other hand, there are a bunch of new consumables like armor kits and oils that are going to be taking the place of these. So uh, Honestly, it's, it's, <laughs> Shadowlands is going to be more bag space requirements and more things to remember. Uh, we'll get a bunch of weak auras up to make sure you don't forget to do any of these 30 different buffs to your character uh, before going into particularly mythic content, if that's the kind of thing that you're into. But today I want to talk about the idea of designing classes and raids around these buffs. So fundamentally, the way that these buffs work is that each copy of a certain class that has one of these buffs only brings its benefit once, right? So uh, your first warrior that you bring to the raid is going to bring your 5% attack power. The second warrior isn't, right? So it's a pretty steep drop-off between your first warrior and your second warrior in terms of how much value they're bringing to your raid, right? Same for mage, priest, monk, and demon hunter. There are also some somewhat similar effects that aren't quite just flat stats, um, that are, are in Shadowlands, but for now, let's just talk about these five as kind of the, the flat raid buff like that. An alternative type of class-specific utility that I want to contrast this with is stuff like uh, Gorfine's Grasp or Death Grip itself. Death Grip itself is for all DKs. Gorfine's Grasp, the Mass Grip version, uh, is just for Blood DKs. Uh, or other, other sorts of effects like that, you know, uh, barrier, darkness, these kinds of pieces of utility that are really powerful and can come from one, or in some cases more, but often just one class has the effect you're looking for, and they can be really important for fights, but they're a little bit less binary, right? You know, there, there's still value to the second death grip. It's less than the first death grip, but it's not zero. And eventually you run out of power, out of value for it, but stuff like Warlock Gateway, uh, there have been many cases where actually all four, <laughs> not just all four, but like four or even five. Uh, on Queen Ajara, there were strategies that revolved around having five gateways placed even. You, you didn't need more than three, but uh, you know, three or four gateways for various fights throughout BFA was pretty standard. So uh, those are a different way of doing this. Let's now hit you with a little bait and switch because uh, you thought you were going to escape the Microsoft Paint rambling style video when I opened up with Wowhead here, but right behind this window is Microsoft Paint. We're going to draw a little graph now. This is, uh, this is, this is going to be a graph of, so on our y-axis we're going to do like rough damage per second that a, a spec brings or class brings, and on our x-axis, that's the one that goes sideways, We'll do, uh, we'll do the class, or the number of the class, number of class brought. So here's a way to think about the way these raid buffs work, right? If you're playing a raid buff bringing spec, say something like, let's use purple here for, for Demon Hunter. Uh, the first Demon Hunter you bring, particularly in BFA, had really, really high value, right? Really big value. And then following that, uh, drop down to, you know, medium. So in, some, in some of the raids of BFA, it was above average. In others, it was even below average, uh, some of the earlier raids of the expansion, uh, that each additional DH brought, right? So this was kind of what it would look like if this is one that we got here, and then we go two, three, four. Let's label these as well. This is going to make all the, the math teachers out there really proud. I'm putting some labels on the axis here. All right, we're doing it. 
Cool. So that's what something like a demon hunter would work would look like, right? By contrast, uh, something like a warlock. We use. I hope I'm. I hope I have roughly the right shade here. A warlock. You know, the first warlock for the the summons and the health stones. Something that's kind of intangible, uh, but brings a lot of value to a raid. So I guess this is kind of more value than than damage per second. But let's change it. Let's change it now. This is going to be the most professional YouTube video of all time. All right, here we go. Observe how effective this is. Wait, why can't I? All right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Microsoft Paint is an extremely versatile application that lets us do all sorts of things really easily, just how I had intended to do it there. All right, so this this acts is actually kind of like value to raid, right? So with Warlocks, you have a little bit of a flatter curve. You know, you, ha you have uh, the first one does bring a lot. Uh, and then after that, they all still bring more than just their damage value, and then they get down to just their damage value. Eventually, eventually you have enough of them, right? Uh, and then there, so there, there are a lot of specs that just are valuable only for their damage, right? Specs that you basically bring them, and they just do damage, and that's all they do. Something like a boomkin, for instance, uh, in a raid setting is is kind of like this. There are some cases where they bring utility that's valuable. You know, they're the first instance of a battle res often, and the best battle res in many raids. But for the most part, they kind of start out here. And then additional Moonkin, all kind of the same, right? You'd bring them, you'd bring them, tuning might shift a spec up or down slightly on this axis. And so you'd bring a lot of Moonkin if they were high up here. Something like Mage and Nihilotha, for instance. First Mage, really valuable because it brought Arcane Intellect. And then the second through 11th Mages were still better than everything else because Mage was extremely overtuned, right? Uh, so that was what Mage looked like here. Now, one of the reasons that Blizzard benefits tremendously from doing raid buffs this way is that it inherently puts a safety net into the class balance, right? No matter how much you mess up the class balance and you have a bunch of different specs all kind of shifted wildly around here, as long as you make things like, okay, the first warrior is worth a lot and then the second and third aren't worth that much, even if you have huge variety in terms of, like, or even if you have a huge discrepancy between the top specs and the bottom specs, the first warrior, if the first warrior's battle shout beats out the difference between warriors, say, low average damage, I'm making up the specific class here, but warriors, say, low average damage and, you know, all the other specs, higher average damage, you're still going to bring one warrior, right? So it creates a floor on how few of a certain spec can get brought, right? If it's a 20-person raid environment, you're never going to have less than one demon hunter and one warrior per raid, assuming those buffs are valuable enough to make up the difference in class balance in any given tier, which historically they have been, right? Priest is a little bit different, but probably will still... I mean, priests have just... We haven't seen a raid where priest hasn't been good in a long time. Um, but I imagine with, yeah, with Fortitude, it'll be in a similar spot where you're going to be uh, almost always wanting to bring that first priest almost no matter what, right? You're going to go out of your way for this. Um, so all these specs are being created in this way to, to make sure, I think, that you're not going to have a case of like 14 warlocks, right? It's hard to have 14 warlocks if you need to bring all of these different specs that are, you know, even if you have a tier where warlock is really high, right? So even if you have a tier where warlock's up here, you still need to bring the first of these three, right? Uh, and if you don't bring that demon hunter, the, war the warlock suffers as well, right? So uh, even if you have class balance being pretty, a pretty big range in class balance, then this is a safety net that creates for that they can create for themselves there. And it means they're kind of free to undertune these specs a little bit or overtune them. And no matter what you do, you're still going to see that representation. Now, that's the upside of this from Blizzard's perspective, right? And from an external observer looking at raid comps, it's going to look better as well. You're going to see more rainbow, more colorful raid comps. However, for the actual raiders, it's a little bit less of a favorable exchange. Um, so for the actual raiders, you get into this kind of gross situation where if you're a demon hunter applying for guilds in a sort of heavily polarized, it wasn't really like this in BFA because the second and third demon hunters were still playable. But uh, if you were in a situation where only the first of a certain spec was really worth bringing, uh, which I imagine we'll be in that place and we have been in that place in the past for some of the specs that bring buffs, right? Some of the specs that bring buffs are going to be high enough for the first copy that they're always worth bringing, and low enough for the second that they're kind of never worth bringing. Uh, particularly the melee versions of these specs, so particularly Demon Hunter and Warrior, if they're damaged a little low for a certain tier, it's going to be really hard to justify a second slot for them. So if you're a warrior looking for a guild, instead of really looking for, like, like the most important characteristic for you when you're trying to find a guild to get into is going to be a guild that doesn't have a warrior, right? 
and so Blizzard talks about this in a couple different ways, right? On the one hand, they like the idea of you looking for certain classes and as a class looking for groups that need you. On the other hand, there's a philosophy that has largely been abandoned recently, but they used to have called bring the player, not, not the class, where, you know, if somebody was better or more, more fun to play with than somebody else, you would choose to bring them. If somebody was your friend, you'd choose to bring them rather than telling them, I'm sorry, we, we already have a warrior, you know, you, you can't raid here. Um, and that, it, to me, I, I would prefer a reversion a little bit away from these kind of heavy incentives putting us on rails largely with our with our raid composition you know if seven of the the spots in our raid are kind of locked in by buffs that they bring uh to me that that restricts the creativity there and although on paper it's going to make compositions look more diverse it's actually restricting the amount of difference in composition you can have right uh it does mean that balancing is a little bit easier for them. It means that bigger errors in class balance will get overlooked because, like, at least in terms of representation, you're still going to see a Demon Hunter. No matter how much they nerf Demon Hunter, we're going to find a way to bring one of them if they bring Chaos Brand, right? Um, so that's something that it, it looks good for heuristics and for, for people tuning into a Race to World first stream. They're going to see a nice colorful comp instead of 14 Warlocks. Um, but I don't think it's actually better to play. And I, I don't think it's particularly fun to be that demon hunter either. To be the player that is doing... You know, because the damage that you're doing yourself is still less than everybody else, right? You're still going into this raid. As, as, if you're one somebody who's just being brought for your buff, you know, you're still not... You're, you're like 14th on the meters. You know you're worth bringing because you're bringing everybody else up. But it's not actually like... It's not particularly rewarding to be in that position. And it's also, it's it's kind of a weird stressor because instead of being one of 14 DPS in a raid, you are one of one Demon Hunter in the raid, right? If a better Demon Hunter comes along, they're going to take your spot, right? If, if you are, you're, you're just kind of in this position where instead of this, there being kind of a flexible DPS pool, there isn't really, right? Your guild can't just have your Demon Hunter not show up for a certain day and still be fine. You're going to have to bring some kind of scuffed alt unless you happen to have two Demon Hunters in your guild, in which case... It's kind of weird, right? Because only one of them is really going to get a spot uh, in most cases if you're, you know, if you're rating seriously. Now, how high up the, you know, the rating leaderboards this actually matters is going to depend largely on how good the balance is, right? The better the balance is, the more likely that the second Demon Hunter will be playable, right? That, that, that means the higher up, the closer the second Demon Hunter is to just being a reasonable consideration. But... If that's the case, then that first Demon Hunter becomes all the more invaluable, right? If you shift this Demon Hunter graph upwards, then that first Demon Hunter becomes even more mandatory. And so it becomes just impossible to have a reasonable raid comp. And BFA was like this. If you didn't have a Demon Hunter in your in your Mythic raiding team, you were trolling, right? There's that that, that Demon Hunter was worth like two of two of another player, right? You'd you'd rather play with 19 people than play with 20 people without a Demon Hunter, uh, damage wise. In not not exactly, but like. 19 and a half, right? You, you were giving up like half a half a raider uh, to lose a demon hunter in BFA. So it comes with drawbacks on either side, right? Regardless of where on the graph, you know, you shift, uh, where where on the y-axis you shift one of these specs that has this curve, it's fe it's going to feel bad on one side or the other, right? Either you're this guild that that is just out of luck because you can't find a demon hunter, or you're this demon hunter who is at the mercy of, you know finding a guild that needs exactly one demon hunter and then your grade spot being only being precarious against every single other demon hunter who might potentially take your spot rather than being in this kind of semi-safe pool of 17 dps where whoever's out that day or whoever's you know underperforming the most gets taken out but there's still room to you know kind of rise and fall in that dps pool and still have a spot um so i don't know this video is kind of it's kind of done the opposite of the good ones of, of having like a focused plan and having focused things to say about stuff. But those are my thoughts on, on raid buffs and stuff. Um, I hope you liked it. I hope you liked the video. Come check out my Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash Dratnos. Although I haven't been streaming too much recently, but I will stream more when Shadowlands comes out, I promise. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.